you guys know how much I love Icon Meals. I've been talking about it forever. Um, you know, I, I grab, you know, burgers here and there from like in and out on the go. And I, I um, you know, am constantly eating a lot of meat because I'm on a carnivore diet. But the Icon Meals make it super convenient for me. Um, they have breakfast selections. They got uh, other meat selections. You get stuff a la carte. You can get just the meat. One of my favorite things from them, aside from the bacon cheeseburger, is they just have shrimp. You know, I just get like a big old thing of shrimp and I cook that sometimes with a steak. So yeah. it's just an add on to a lot of the stuff that I'm already eating. But I absolutely love uh, Icon Meals and I think you guys should give it a shot too. Yeah, Icon Meals isn't just for people that are either on the war on carbs, not war on carbs like me. Um, when Mark's not looking, I actually will throw in what? a little bit more carbs here and there, potentially some Icon Meals pancakes because they're incredible. Um, yeah, they fit literally any diet, like whatever the diet is. If you're full, full vegan, I think they even have like full vegetarian meals. Oh. Carnivore, they have full carnivore meals. Yeah. If you're like me, they have stuff with potatoes, rice, all the good stuff. Um, really, like I said, any diet, they have an option for you. And I think one of the weird things to say about Icon Meals, but it's true, is that like it's legit real food. I'm telling you, some of these meal prep companies, suspect. But like <laughs> you get a lot of, I guess there's a lot of variability. Like they have the chicken cordon bleu. There's the sliders. Yes. Oh! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> got to pause real quick. The sliders. Um, and there's chicken fajitas. There's there's sweet potato fries, bro. Like everything is so dope. And then the, the macros are all there. It's just there's so much different food to eat that you can make fit your day. Yeah. On, a lot of stuff in there that you normally wouldn't even know how to cook for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On top of all that, it's super easy and convenient. Not only is it easy to just take it out the fridge, put it in the microwave, but they'll ship it directly to your door. Head over to iconmeals.com right now. Check out the entire selection because you're going to sit there for a hot minute, uh, throw a bunch of stuff in your car, and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT for 10% off your entire order. So right now I'm eating that birthday cake perfect keto It's not bar. your birthday, bro. It's <laughs> not my birthday for another mm, mm, seven months. Still but celebrating. even so, I think it has some sprinkles in it. And it's so soft and gooey <laughs> and juicy. Like that, that, not juicy, but gooey. But that bar, that bar is so good. Gooey. I don't know about that. Word. Gooey. <laughs> gooey. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying the uh, perfect keto bars too. And, you know, I'm doing the carnivore diet. And you guys know, you know, a lot of people have been following along, been doing carnivore 100. But it's great to have a snack in here, you know, there, here and there, you know. You, otherwise, you're just going to lose your mind, mm -hmm. you know. And if you try to abstain from stuff for too long, it can make you ricochet or go the wrong way, go the wrong direction for too long and cause too much damage. So I've been digging the uh, the birthday cake bars a lot. Those are freaking awesome. And then I haven't had it in a little while, but I remember the cookie dough bars are amazing. And that cinnamon roll one is just absolutely amazing as well. Yeah, I'm still all team uh, cookie dough. You can't get me off that. Uh, the Perfect Keto Bars are perfect on the go snack or at the office or just even at home. Head over to perfectketo.com slash power project at checkout. Enter promo code power project bundle for $25 off any order of $100 or more or power project 10 for $10 off any order of $40. It's a great way to cheat the system and get your collagen in for the day as well. Switching gears a little bit. How would you get into all this uh, mess in the first place? Ooh, yeah. Great, great uh, <laughs> question. So. My background is I was, um, I'll briefly touch a couple stages back, but I was in uh, undergrad. I was studying exercise and nutrition science. I was, uh, I was a basketball player and a baseball player in college. So I was really focused on performance, wasn't really focused on nutrition. I learned about nutrition in a class, I kind of started seeing how it was a, a lever that I could pull to improve my performance in the sports I was playing. So I started, um, started doing paleo. Uh, that was kind of my first thing I started doing, paying attention to my diet, doing paleo. I graduated from undergrad um, by kind of a funny story. I, I somehow ended up doing a physique competition. Uh, so I, I, I jumped. Basically, I was sitting one night with my roommate. We were sitting on the couch eating uh, pizza, you know, just like not in tune with our diets at all. And we, we were talking about a friend that was doing a physique competition. He was like, you know, have you, uh, I was like, I think I could do something like that. And he's like, no, there's no way we're sitting here eating pizza. Like you'd never be able to get your diet in check. <laughs> so I signed up for a physique competition 12 weeks later that night. Oh, wow. and I was just like, I'm doing it. Let's do it. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah. And, uh, while, while I was training for that, I was following, you know, this is before I knew about keto. I was following low fat, uh, carb cycling, uh, calorie restricted, tons of cardio, all the things you can do to just destroy yourself and destroy your health. <laughs> I did all, all of those. I got down to, you know, 5% body fat or something like that. 
And I looked at myself and I'm like, you know, my physique looks awesome, but I feel like hell, you know, like <laughs> what's, what's going on here. Um, so then, then I, that was kind of my, like, I got to look at nutrition a little bit more and understand this because like, there's more than just calories and there's more than just, you know, macros and stuff like there, there's something else that needs to be paid attention to. So I decided to go back to school for, um, exercise, I'd go get my master's for exercise and nutrition science. So I went down to university of Tampa and I studied down there and I was in, I went to a conference and I was introduced to keto by Dr. D'Augustino. He was presenting at the conference. So, you know, great introduction by one of the best in the, in the industry. Um, and I started studying it for sports performance. So I, you know, when I first heard of keto, I was like, Oh, great weight loss diet, but nothing for me. I'm not looking to lose weight, so I'm not going to start it. And, um, but then I started seeing, okay, endurance athletes have benefits from keto. Cool. What about strength and power? There's not a lot of research out there on that. Could they benefit from it too? So I started working in an exercise physiology lab, studying keto and sports performance in like college athletes and college students. And then, um, I stumbled across a book that was called tripping over the truth by Travis Christofferson, which highly recommend for anybody out there who hasn't read it. Uh, and it opened up the therapeutic side of this diet that I didn't know about. I had no idea that the keto diet was potentially beneficial for cancer and, uh, diabetes and Alzheimer's. And I was like, wow, there's, there's something more to this. So I, um, I kind of shifted focuses and I was fortunate enough that I was actually able to go volunteer, uh, in Dr. D'Augustino's lab for a few weeks, uh, and get to learn from those people, which like best experience of my life. It, it really like, it put a lot of purpose in my heart for doing this, seeing like the hard work that those people were doing and, and how much good they were doing for the world. It, it, it was like, man, I want to spend the rest of my life doing this type of stuff. And, uh, and then from there, I, I kind of decided that my intention and purpose was going to be to try to get out there and educate the masses a little bit more um, and try to help this research get out there for the general population to, to learn more about. And, uh, and now I'm in this mess of it now. <laughs> um, can you explain a little bit to our listeners uh, how Dominic uh, D'Agostino u- utilizes uh, the ketogenic diet? I mean, very unconventional way. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, people that were like scuba diving or something like that, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, he, he does a lot of work with it, It's, he's like a superhero, right? Like when you look at the stuff, this guy hey, does if anybody 600 has pounds look, for 10 reps and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I saw him the other day. Look, he was like curling weight that I was like, I don't even know if I bench that weight. You're like sitting there <laughs> dumbbell curling. Like, What's going on? Um, but yeah, so he started getting into studying ketones. He was studying oxygen toxicity. So it was, you know, these like seal divers who, when they, um, they start getting down to like uh, really deep depths and they're underwater for a prolonged, prolonged period of time. Uh, they, they start having seizures under there and it's from like a buildup of it's, it's oxygen toxicity that causes that or that causes that. And uh, I don't remember the exact story of how he stumbled upon ketones. I think it had something to do with um, he had stumbled across the work of Dr. Veach, Richard Veach, who actually just recently passed away. So mm-hmm. rest in peace to him. He's one of the, the greats in this industry. Um, but I think he stumbled across his work and it kind of, he made a connection that he thought ketones would be beneficial for that. And he found that, you know, supplemental ketones were incredible for reducing oxygen toxicity. And I think that kind of opened up the door for him to start studying it for more, uh, for different metabolic disorders. And, uh, you know, the people in his lab are doing, you know, like Dr. Angela Poff, if nobody's ever come across her stuff, she kind of took the stuff that he was doing and started studying it for cancer. And she did a lot of really great work in, in you know, ketones and ketogenic dieting for cancer. And so his lab is just producing some of the best work in the, in the space and, and stuff that's like, it's changing people's lives. And, and if it hasn't changed, it hasn't changed as many people's lives as it should yet, but it's coming. Like the stuff that they're doing is going to change this world. And, you know, it's huge kudos to them for what I think doing. if it wasn't for Dominic, we wouldn't have exogenous ketones, right? <laughs> No. Well, we, we would probably have ketone esters, which right. if anybody's ever tried that, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it tastes bad. Um, if, you know, we talk about the, the digestive problems of having, uh, the MCTs, it's about tenfold with the, with the ketone. Esters. I think they're getting better with them now. Perfect. But yeah. Before him, there was ketone esters that were super expensive and not, um, able, but the general population couldn't really get access to them. And now because of him, we have these ketone salts. So cool. yeah. Are there differences in terms of the application of keto when it comes to, because you mentioned endurance athletes, but then strength Mm -hmm. and power athletes, martial artists, are there differences in the way they can apply it if they want to do a ketogenic diet for better performance? Yeah. So I always start this conversation by kind of talking about like a little bit of self-realization and realizing where you're at. So for the elite athlete or somebody who's trying to get that extra, you know, one to 2%, 
definitely so you got to tailor it. Like there's definitely some things that you have to do, but for the, the average Joe, like myself, I'm going to do just fine in those areas following a standard ketogenic diet. Well, I guess I shouldn't say standard ketogenic diet. I think that higher protein is going to be beneficial, but I think that I'm going to be able to, I've seen it myself. I can make strength gains. I can make uh, muscle gain. I can, you know, still have a, a good amount of like uh, explosiveness and things like that following a keto diet. So I think that for those people, I don't really think there's a whole lot that you have to do. You know, I don't know that if you're just an average Joe that's going to a CrossFit gym, I don't think that you really need to do, a, you know, 300 grams of, of cyclic dextrin or something like that before you, you see your workout. I don't think that's going to really move the needle for you. But for the elite athletes out there or the people who are trying to take it that extra step, I think that there is some things that you need to do. And I think that for those people, it's probably some carbohydrate manipulation, um, using carbohydrates around the training session, uh, kind of using them as an ergogenic aid, I think is, is pretty beneficial. Um, and then it's, from there, there's probably some hyper-focused things you can do, like you know, determining where your protein should actually be. So if you want to dial it in a little bit, you know, where should your protein be based on your body composition and how you're training? Um, where should your calorie intake be? What supplements can you take to kind of, uh, uh, enhance your, your training? Um, you know, how should you be using electrolytes, uh, to make sure that you're getting the most out of your training, things like that. So I think that it's highly individualized, but for, you know, 80% of the people out there, probably even more, probably 95% of the people out there just go in standard keto with higher protein is going to be just fine. In my opinion. Can you explain a little bit about how, like how the body utilizes glycogen versus how the body utilizes fat when it comes to producing energy, when it comes to exercise. Um, and maybe, uh, is there a difference in the way a high, uh, an, an athlete that utilizes higher fat performs? Got it. Yes. So, um, glycogen, which is just like your stored, stored glucose, right? So we have glycogen stores in our cells. Um, glycogen can be broken back down into glucose and it can be used as energy. It is a more rapid form of energy. So you can, glucose and glycogen are, um, it, you're going to have access to it and it's going to be able to produce energy more quickly than fat. So I think that that's kind of an important consideration. Um, but when it comes to like athletes who are fat adapted and, and how, what was that specific question on like, how you want to? Yeah. The difference in the way potentially a fat adapted athlete performs versus an mm -hmm. individual that is eating 300, 400 grams of carbs, but fairly low fat. Got it. Yes. Yeah. So one of the great studies that looks at this is a study by Dr. Jeff Volick um, is when he was at Ohio State University. There's a 2016 study that looked at, and this was an endurance athlete. So we'll, okay. we'll kind of start there. Um, but he looked at carb adapted athletes versus keto adapted athletes. And, you know, one of the things he saw is that um, across the board on performance, there was really, there was no, no difference in performance. I think that the, the high fat group saw a little bit better performance, but what was, uh, what was different was the fuel utilization. So for somebody who is, and we kind of know this from a lot of research, if you're carb adapted and you've never really gotten yourself metabolically flexible, when you start using carbs, uh, you, when you burn through those, it is hard for you to tap into this extra fuel source that is fat and ketones. So for somebody who, and, and the reason why this is important in the endurance, com in endurance community is that you can only store, you know, a few thousand calories in the form of carbohydrates. So, you know, if you're talking 2000 calories in the form of glycogen and then whatever calories you can get from eating carbs, that's not that much. When you talk about, you know, a, somebody with like 5% body fat still has like 20,000 calories in stored fat. So for somebody who is fat adapted, they can tap into this nearly unlimited fuel supply which means being able to maintain uh, exercise intensity for a longer duration. So I think that that's probably the big one. Now, where that, that pans out really well for uh, endurance athletes who aren't training at a high intensity, and it, and it pans out really well for average Joes who maybe are training at, at a regular or at a you know, higher intensity. Now, for the elite athlete, um, being able to maintain high energy output, only metabolizing fat, you know, we don't have research on it, but speculation is that maybe not the best approach for them. When you start talking about like, you know, a, a basketball player, right? Like a professional basketball player or, um, you know, somebody who's doing more sh like short duration sprinting or something like that. That's high intensity, um, but not it's it's not like being, you don't have to sustain that energy for a long time. Those people may have a little bit more complications with, you know, just metabolizing fat. But for most, most of us out there who are just exercising, what that means is it means having access to a fuel source that's unlimited um, that can kind of keep us going for a longer period of time and, and prevent us from fatiguing too. I mean, 
when we're pr producing ketones, remember our brain are, is using those ketones. And when our brain's metabolizing ketones, that means that we're, we're going to have more energy. We're going to have better mood. We're going to have probably more determination to get through a workout. So you're just going to be able to stick with that training a little bit better when you're, when you're using fat for energy. Uh, you ever use um, like different kind of carbohydrates? You, you mentioned earlier about performance carbohydrates, I think before mm -hmm. or after exercise. Um, are those anything in particular or are you just talking about like um, healthy carbohydrates? Yeah, so I've experimented with both. Um, I, I do before instead of after because I think that they're, I think carbs are better as an ergogenic aid than they are for like replenishing glycogen. I think that, you know, there's a fair amount of research out there that shows that we can replenish glycogen without the need to eat them. So I don't really think that afterwards is really provides that much benefit Before, unless maybe you're kind of going uh, before the workout, how far in advance approximately. Uh, so it depends on the source. So if I'm doing a whole food, healthy carbohydrate, like you said, then I'll usually try to do like hour and a half before. And like, if I'm doing a sweet potato, like hour and a half, two hours before, but I've also done some experimenting with like the, the resistant starches, like the, you can right. uh, super starch. And I, it didn't do much for me for like resistance training, but I did notice that it was amazing for playing basketball. So I, I play mm -hmm. a lot of basketball still and, um, doing it like 15 to 30 minutes before playing. I actually combine that with exogenous ketones. So I'll well, do uh, ketone salts with the resistant starch you can and phenomenal, like in terms of energy, but then like sustaining that energy, just really great. And, you know, I would speculate that it's probably because as a fat adapted person, I have access to those carbohydrates and the ketones. And then as I burn through them, I'm tapping into back into those fat stores, which mm -hmm. is kind of allowing me to, to prolong that. So that's what I've used is that you can super starch and I've seen, I've seen some pretty good things. And with that. that style of carbohydrate, um, just doesn't have the same impact on your insulin and glucose levels. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So it's a lot more slower digesting and it doesn't lead to that massive spike in blood sugar that you would get if you had, you know, the people who have like, you know, some sugar source before they work out, that's like super fast digesting. You and just don't get that same. I believe fat. there's a few brands too. You mentioned you can is one of them. Mm -hmm. I, maybe that one was, uh, in part with uh jeff volnick i think maybe he's yep. involved in that company right and then there's another one yep. called three carb i believe is another one i don't know if you've heard of that oh i haven't before. seen that one yeah that's um I'll, his name will come to me in a little bit but it's a long distance runner a uh, friend of mine oh, that nice. i think uh helped create it but i'm not sure if it's the same style of carb but i think it's the same principle that's really cool yeah slower but, digesting right yeah. No, like the, the application of UCAN plus ketones before something, something like basketball, because I feel like basketball is somewhat similar. I mean, not totally, but similar to in some ways to martial arts. Um, mm -hmm. And that, damn, Brian I'm going to try that. Brian McKenzie. Have you heard of Brian McKenzie before? He's oh, no, a really, uh, really heavy into like, uh, like just how you breathe. He teaches a lot of that and pose running and mm. a particular way of running, a particular style of running and stuff like that. He's, he's here in Northern California with us up near, uh, okay. Kelly Sturette. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kelly yeah. Sturette before the yep. mobility guy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's fascinating. You know, all these different things, all these different weird things, uh, that we can tap into. So you're mentioning it's a slower digesting carb. So maybe also too, maybe. You know, if you have it 15 minutes before, maybe that when you're, you know, half an hour or 30 minutes into your basketball, maybe that's when it's starting to really pick up and you're like, oh crap, something else is, is hitting me, right? Yeah. And I think that for something like basketball that, or, you know, any, any sport that is the kind of that hybrid between like endurance, but also like explosiveness and muscular okay. strength, you know, there's a lot of sports that fall into that. I think it's perfect for that because, you know, most people can have enough energy to kind of get going, but it's like, can, how long can you sustain that level of intensity that you want to train at? And I think that like having these multiple energy sources that you can kind of pull in at different times of the training is just super beneficial. You mentioned some self-experimentation, like what kind of stuff do you do? Are you like pricking your finger all the time or like what, what kind of weird stuff have you gotten into? Um, yeah, so I've just recently, I just wrapped up uh, doing some breath ketone testing, comparing it to blood ketone testing during uh, longer duration fasting. So that's kind of been uh, doing like 36, 48, 72 hour fasts and then testing uh, breath and blood ketones. So I like to do that. Um, I also like to do a lot of testing of different foods. So I, I like to see, I don't really test ketones as much. I don't think that it's that important, but I do like to test blood glucose because it's kind of crazy what you'll see. I mean, some people like I have a buddy who is wearing a continuous blood glucose monitor and he found that like sweet potatoes, no go for him. Like mm. his blood sugar goes through the roof after he has a sweet potato. But I found that when I have a sweet potato, nothing, it's like 
super moderate, uh, you know, maybe a slight increase. And then, so I like to kind of tease out like what foods my body handles best and then seeing like, and then what combination of foods work best. So like if I have a sweet potato with a steak, uh, what impact does that have on my blood glucose if I just had the sweet potato alone, right? So I like to do a lot of that kind of testing. And then um, also like looking at different things like impact of blood sugar on exercising in like the fasted versus fed state. I like to do some, some experiments there. Um, so yeah, I think th those are kind of the big ones. And then also, uh, blood work is a big one too. So I, I did, I think it was about midway through last year, I did six weeks of carnivore and then I, I did blood work pre and post to, to test and see what, Oh my God, you're not there. dead. <laughs> and I'm not dead. Yeah. Look at it. I, wow. I ate red meat for six <laughs> weeks and I didn't die. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. It's great um, to have, great to have some of that, uh, some of that information, you know, like that you can kind of see like how your body actually reacted to it do you have any information about yeah. uh what heavier individuals may be burning when they're exercising because i have a friend uh that owns a gym they own a crossfit box and they have i wish i were, could remember and recall the the type of apparatus they're using to test i think it has something to do with their breath but mm -hmm. basically what what they have found is that a lot of their heavy heavier individuals and it's not all but most of them most of their heavy, heavier individuals were bl burning through glucose like crazy, mm -hmm. even when they were in a keto, like they got them on a keto diet. They were even producing ketones and they were, you know, a couple weeks, couple months in, but you know, maybe that adaption, you know, hasn't, maybe they haven't adapted to the diet just yet. Have you seen anything like that? Yeah. So, you know, one thing it, it there's a difference between when our body starts producing ketones uh, and then when they actually start using those ketones mm. that it's producing. So for, for somebody who, like you're saying, when you say bigger, do you mean like kind of overweight or just yes, like yeah. big, like yeah, muscular? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, overweight. Okay. Yes. Overweight. Yeah. So for people, you know, who are, who are dealing with weight problems, that's, those are probably people who are a little bit more metabolically inflexible, you know, meaning they don't transition to burning fat and then things like that as well. What I have seen is that for those people, it does take longer to become fat adapted because you know, we're, we're born in a, in a ketogenic state, right? Like when we're born as babies, we're in a state of ketosis. When we're drinking breast milk, there's Best a time in my life. Yeah. When we're, when we're drinking breast milk, you know, there's MCTs in there, we're in ketosis, but then we get introduced to solid foods, right? And the way that our, our society set up solid foods is usually cereal. Uh, and then from there, we start eating carbs, we turn into carb burners, and we never go back. Mm -hmm. So the degree that you become removed from this kind of baseline that you should be at is kind of going to determine how long it's going to take you to adapt. So if you've been following, uh, you know, high processed carbohydrate diet for decades, like many people have, it's going to take you a while to transition to being a fat burner, and then producing ketones, but then also using those ketones, because you know, we ketones have to be taken into our cells uh, via these transporters that are uh, they're different than what what than what you need for glucose to get in there. Right. So these transporters do have to be upregulated and that does take time. And uh, I, th I speculate that for somebody who has, is kind of coming from, you know, a long period of time of eating a lot of carbs, it's going to take a little bit longer to upregulate those transporters. Along with that, I'm, I'm actually curious about this. You mentioned that, and then you also mentioned that your buddy's uh, blood sugar who ate that sweet potato went up vastly more than yours. Does Was he as active as you? And what I mean is, like, does the level of an individual's activity, performance-wise, athletically, affect how high their blood sugar goes up when they do have something like a sweet potato or anything like that? Yeah, so, I mean, my answer on the question is that, yes, I think that, um, you know, physical activity is a great predictor of insulin sensitivity, right? So it's a great predictor of you being able to efficiently utilize glucose, um, which means getting it out of the blood quicker, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like the situation with my buddy, he's also very active. You know, mm -hmm. he does uh, a lot of, he exercises probably four or five times a week, um, trains at a pretty high intensity. Uh, he's a pretty big guy in terms of like has a fair amount of muscle mass and things like that. So with somebody like him, I speculated probably being more along the lines of digestion, right? Like he's maybe digesting those carbohydrates a lot more quickly, uh, which is probably causing that increase in blood sugar fast, faster. Now, one thing I'd have to go back and check with him, but I think he told me that he was also that he, it maintained being elevated for a long period of time afterwards. So, you know, that could be something that would be 
maybe you need to take a look at and see, okay, why did it stay elevated? Is it because were you not being active in the couple of days prior to testing that? Um, had you not been very active that day, did you do something with your diet the day before that kind of threw things off, off a little bit that made, made you react in that way? Um, you know, unfortunately, our biochemistry is so dynamic that uh, it's so hard to tease out all the variables to figure out what's actually causing you to have that reaction, which is like kind of the headache with doing these self experiments, because it's like, oh, you know, I have a hypothesis, and I do this experiment. And I'm like, well, this is why that happened. And then you think about it and you're like, well, I didn't consider like the 15 other things that, right. that may be causing it. So yeah. is your friend uh, ectomorph mesomorph? Where, where is he? Oh, good question. I would say. Because I think Man, if he was, he's a, he's a if he was a hybrid, if he, yeah, if he's like in the middle, like, or if he was ever fat, you know, I, I think that's going to really, I think if you were just ever fat, I think that you might have a little bit different insulin response than the next person or glucose response in this case. Totally. And person. he, he definitely is somebody who he, uh, I wouldn't, I don't think that he was ever fat, but he was definitely not eating like the best diet for a long period of time. I think he was carrying extra body weight that he didn't need to be carrying. So I would say that's, and, and I agree with you too. I think that like we can restore our ability to use carbs to some degree, but I don't think that for most people, if you've spent decades destroying that process of your body, it's not going to go back to being, you know, what it was like, you're probably always going to have that deficiency in that area that you're going to kind of always have to work around. How about electrolytes? Cause uh, we were talking about supplements and you mentioned electrolytes and I love using electrolytes before like I train, et cetera. So when do you time them and then why are they, why are they so useful? Yeah. So, um, in general, I think electrolytes are, are very important because, you know, if you look at the key electrolytes like magnesium, potassium, sodium, uh, everybody's afraid of sodium, so they don't need enough of it. Se I think 70% of the population is magnesium deficient. Mm. So everybody could probably benefit from using electrolytes. Um, but on a low carb diet, it becomes even more important because when our insulin levels are lower, we excrete more water, uh, which can kind of throw off our electrolyte balances. So, uh, that's the reason why you hear people like, oh, I have the keto flu and they think that it's like carbohydrate withdrawal. It's like, no, you really, most 90% of those symptoms are your, your electrolyte deficient. So you need to, to kind of work around that, which that can be exasperated by being somebody who exercises, right? Like I, I have a, a big sweat rate. Like when I work out, if I walk into the gym, I already start sweating. <laughs> I, I am ridiculous. So, so I have to really focus on that. And because that electrolyte deficiency and dehydration can be amplified by you know, the way that my, my body is, um, in terms of timing on it, I think that it's better to do it in the pre-workout window because, you know, we see that, that being even like 1% dehydrated or deficient electrolytes can, it can lead to a noticeable decrement in performance. So if you want to get the most out of that performance, I think having it before is important. And there is some research that shows that in the post-workout window, we're not great at absorbing uh, electrolytes. So I think it can actually be a little bit more wasteful in the immediate post-workout um, time frame. But I would say that for most people, I would say the whole day um, utilization of electrolytes is probably more important. Like making sure that you're getting enough electrolytes in over the course of the 24 hour day is probably more important than any specific time of the day that you're taking it. You know, I think that like at some, some times could be like sodium, for instance, having that before a workout, I think can be beneficial. Um, magnesium before you go to bed probably has some benefit in it there too. But in terms of just keeping your stores at an adequate level, I think that just keeping it, keeping it in mind over the course of the day and having it, you know, enough of it is, is going to be most important. And what about just having a small amount of carbohydrate as well to help hydrate the muscle a little further? Um, because, you know, I, it's kind of my belief that you can have some carbohydrates and especially if you're trying to be a high level performer. So in that case, like, why not have maybe a half a potato or a full potato at night to kind of get you ready for your next days, uh, whatever the thing is that you're going to do. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cause you know, those, those carbs, when they, when glycogen gets stored, glycogen also stores water, right? So when our cells are storing those carbohydrates, water is getting stored. I think that that's definitely beneficial. Um, I guess the question then becomes is, do you need to top off those stores? Right? So, you know, if you're somebody who is long-term keto adaptive, this was something that was found in research of really long-term keto adapted athletes. So people who are athletes, one, so, you know, really good metabolisms, but then two, they've been doing keto for a long time. They don't really have a problem with their glycogen stores. They, they're still pretty adequate. So is it going to provide much more benefit? I'm not sure, but for somebody who's kind of dipping in and out of ketosis, not staying in all of the time, 
um, maybe their glycogen stores aren't as adequately replenished. In that case, I think it would be great um, for both the, the sake of hydrating the muscle, but then kind of keeping some of those carb stores in there. And, and your fasting glucose and somebody else's fasting glucose amongst people that are healthy, whether you had carbohydrates or not, would be similar, right? Um, what do you mean by that? Your, your resting uh, fasted blood glucose levels would be similar amongst someone who's healthy, who's not on a low carb diet and yourself. Is that right ish? Um, it depends. So I, my fasting blood glucose gets pretty low. Mm. And for people who have been following the diet for a while, it seems to be the same. Like, you know, it's typical for me to be down in like the seventies in the morning. And then in some cases, even like down into the sixties, you know, the recommended, uh, range, which is a ridiculous number is like between 80 and 120, which right. is like, okay, where do you fall in that range? <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, it could be all, but I, you know, most people who you consider to be like healthy, like people who are maybe following like a paleo diet, um, exercising and things like that. A lot of times I got a pretty good chance to see this when I was working in the lab that I was at, because we would have um, college athletes coming in, right? So they're athletes are people that take care of themselves pretty well. Like they, you know, they're eating pretty good food and they're exercising and things like that. A lot of these guys would come in with still blood glucose in like the upper nineties, mm. um, which it's hard to know what the cause of that is. You know, is it stress induced? Is it because they're not sleeping very well? Um, is it because, you know, maybe when they came in for the test, they had just been out the bar the night before because <laughs> they're college kids, you know, who, who really knows why, but um, it does seem like even those people that their blood sugar doesn't quite get to the same level that you might get if you're going full blown keto, but comparing like paleo to, low, to just a low carb diet, probably pretty similar. Right. And my point is, it's just that like it, even when you're on a low carb diet, your blood glucose is just not like completely wiped out and you're not in any danger of like passing out or anything <laughs> like right. you, you feel plenty healthy and you feel plenty good to go play some basketball and go kick some ass. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean that, and that's kind of the, uh, well, one, that's like, we were talking about gluconeogenesis earlier. It's like, that's the reason why your blood sugar doesn't go to zero, right? You, you keep blood sugar available through this process. Um, but yeah, when you, when you have ketones circulating, you know, anybody who out there who's never done keto, but if has had like the low blood sugar feeling, we know what that feels like, right? It's like you're shaky. Uh, your brain's not working well. You kind of feel like hell, um, that, you know, you might get that at 75, blood, uh, you know, like, like a 75 reading on your blood glucose test. But when you're keto and you have like ketones that are like, you know, 0.7 or higher or something like that, you don't feel that way. And it's because the ketones are really replacing the need for that. So, you know, I had one case back when I was working in the lab where we had a girl who her blood sugar got down to like 52, which like for most people, you'd be like, man, she's going to pass out. But her ketones were like 2.2. And she was like, I feel incredible. Like there's, you know, I don't, I don't feel anything. And I'm sitting there kind of free. I was new to it. So I'm kind of freaking out like, oh boy, she's at like 55. Hopefully she doesn't drop in this lab. But yeah, um, yeah it's just when you have those ketones elevated, you just don't need to have that blood sugar at the same level. So the uh, the ketogenic diet is awesome for weight loss. The uh, the cognitive benefits that you talked about earlier in the first part of this uh, conversation sound awesome, but we're fairly vain and we just want to get jacked. Um, <laughs> what, what I've heard from a lot of athletes, um, in regards to being on the, the diet is like, they have a hard time chasing the pump. You know, it's like they want to feel good. They want to look good. Um, other than like some of the performance carbs that you had mentioned, um, do you have any tips for an athlete that's maybe wanting to do the uh, ketogenic diet or they currently are doing the ketogenic diet, but they're chasing aesthetics over, you know, the weight loss or even like you said, the cognitive benefits. Yeah. Great question. So on the, uh, on the pump side of things, uh, I think that for a lot of them, it's, you got to just give yourself some time to get adapted and, and that'll come back. I mean, I remember when I first started to, like, I would kind of walk into the gym feeling a little depleted and, and definitely feel like I couldn't get a pump going, but the longer that I stuck to it. And when I started realizing that like, ah, have some sodium before you work out, you know, that, that makes a big difference. So that's, that stuff can come back. But when you talk about body composition and gaining muscle and stuff, um, I anecdotally, I've seen it in myself doing DEXA scans where I've been able to put on plenty of muscle. I mean, you talk to a lot of guys that have done keto and, you know, look, looking at you guys, I know you guys are, are low carb fans. It's pretty apparent that you can put on muscle without having to eat carbohydrates. Um, I think the biggest things to, to take into consideration if you want to maximize that are there, there's probably three things. One is that you want to make sure that you're providing the correct training stimulus, right? If you're not providing a training stimulus that is conducive of you know, hypertrophy, then you're not going to experience muscle gain. So most important, you know, progressively overloading your muscles in a style that's conducive of hypertrophy. 
Two, making sure you're getting enough protein in, right? Like we were talking earlier, you have to have an adequate amount of protein if you're going to. You know, I think that you can probably maintain muscle mass pretty well on a lower protein keto, but building it's a different story. Have to make sure that you're providing enough. Calories is a big one too. I think that people who are saying that they have a hard time gaining muscle on keto, and then you look at their diet, it's like, well, you're having 1,500 calories. Of course, you're having a hard time gaining muscle. You're not, you know, fueling your body appropriately. Uh, but then another one that I think the fourth one, I guess, that many people don't think about is the electrolytes because, you know, things like potassium play a really, really important role in muscle protein synthesis, right? So if you don't have an adequate amount of potassium in your diet because, you know, a low carb diet can lead you to being potassium deficient, then you're not, those processes aren't going to be as efficient. So you're not going to be make, creating muscle as much. So I think those are probably the four biggest things, training stimulus, protein, calories, and electrolytes. And if you do those things, then, you know, I just seen too many people that have built a lot of muscle doing it that way to think that you can't do it. You know, along these lines, I'm curious about this because we were talking about becoming fat adapted and the time it takes to become fat adapted. Um, but uh, can an individual that's been doing keto or very low carb that is fat adapted, can it go the other way where they do not process carbohydrates as well because they're not eating as many carbohydrates as they used to, or that doesn't really happen? Yeah. So there is some research that shows that like when you do a, like a massive or not even a massive one, but doing like a carbohydrate refeed after following like a low carb diet, you can have some uh, insulin sensitivity issues where you don't metabolize those carbohydrates as well. Mm. Um, but a lot of those studies are studies where they did like a couple days of like low carb or keto dieting and, and you know, we're not really long enough to yeah. see if, if you would actually do, if you were adapted to the diet, what would happen. Right. So I speculate that for most people out there, if you've been following keto for a while and you've restored your metabolism, you're going to be able to use carbohydrates pretty well if you reintroduce them, but you're going to want to ease into it. So I think that if you are going from 30 grams of carbs a day to 250, I think you're going to probably have some problems in actually using those. You know, not going to be the best approach, but I think that if you kind of transition into it and you know, there was a, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but there was a really good study conducted a few years ago where they basically were doing a, a, a keto diet. They did it for like 20 days. Then they transitioned to like a low carb diet and then they transitioned to like a Mediterranean diet. And, you know, in, in that study, they were looking at body composition more. So they were looking at like, it, could they maintain their weight loss if, if they did that approach? But I think that that kind of shed light on the right, right way to do it. You know, they, they kind of went, all right, we're keto. We're at 30 grams. Now we're going to go low carb. Maybe we're at like a hundred grams. Uh, now we're going maybe like 150 grams and kind of working your way up that way. I think that's going to be a good approach, but the source of the carb matters too, right? Like I don't think that there's anybody's body out there who's going to do great with eating a bunch of gluten and wheat and stuff like that. Right. So, you know, having the right kinds of carbohydrates when you are reintroducing them, I think is going to be a, a big factor. You noticed anything different with any particular training protocol in terms of like burning fat or in terms of, uh, Maybe, maybe you just try to get yourself into ketosis faster, um, or maybe while you're in ketosis, you're trying to do something more efficient to burn fat. Yeah. So we actually, uh, when I was in grad school, we actually did an experiment where we were trying to see if we could get people adapted to the diet, which it's hard to measure adaptation because you can't really measure if your cells are taking in the ketones. You don't really have, we don't have a way to do that yet, but the speculation was that, you know, is there a type of training we can do to increase ketone levels? And uh, high intensity interval training was something that we saw that was really effective for ramping up ketone production. So really training at that level um, that would kind of stimulate some fat burning, what was better for getting higher levels up. So I think that um, for now, how does that correlate to the average person out there? Probably playing some sort of like sport or some sort of activity that is has an endurance component to it, but also an, a component that has to do with uh, elevated intensity. Mm. So I don't think that like just lifting weights uh, especially the way that most people are lifting weights nowadays where it's like do a set of bench and scroll on Instagram for 30 set, you know, that's probably not going to ramp up your ketone production. Um, but you know, having something that's like cardiovascular based because you know, when we're doing cardio work, we're burning a lot of fat, right? Our heart burn, runs on fat. So that's what we're using there. Um, and then doing that at like a level that's pretty intense, I think is the best way to really ramp up that fat burning and ketone production. Are there any other supplements that people can think of adding in to their ketogenic diet? Like we talked about um, MCT oils, we talked about uh, ketones potentially. Anything else you think people can think about in specific yeah, so like situations? To, yeah, I like to look at supplements as, you know, there's 
the the reasons for taking a supplement is to either either fill in a gap in your diet mm -hmm. or a gap in your lifestyle or help you get closer to a, a specific goal, right? So that's how I think you determine what you should take for supplements. At baseline, I think that everybody on a keto diet should take electrolytes. You know, I think that that's the one that no matter what your goal is, you need to be doing that. Um, MCTs have some benefit. I think that it's probably good for people to take those too, but not necessarily essential. But then from there, I think it's like, what does your diet look like? So if you are you know, let's say that you are, you just don't like red meat and fish, right? And you're like, I'm just eating chicken right now. Mm. Well, you probably need to be supplementing with, um, you know, some, some omega threes of some sort. You probably need to be adding in some like micronutrients that you're uh, not going to be getting from like chicken. So I think that, that that's like something to look at. And then like, let's look at lifestyle components. If you live in, uh, I'm from the Midwest originally, right? So in the Midwest, you don't get sunshine for five months out of the year. Yes. Probably need to be supplementing with vitamin D, right? <laughs> you, you know, you don't have access to, to sunshine, probably need to add that. And then on the goal side of things, it's like, okay, if your goal is to have really good workout se sessions, then what are some supplements you could take to improve your workout? I think that things like beta alanine, citrulline, um, I think that those things can be really great. Uh, Caffeine is obviously a really great thing to improve your workouts. Uh, if your primary goal is to uh, reduce stress, you know, then I think there's some great things out there like ashwagandha and different adaptogens like that. Um, if you're trying to improve your brain function, I think there's some phenomenal nootropics out there like alpha GPC, phosphatidylserine, different things like that. So, you know, like I said, if, on a keto diet at baseline, it's got to be electrolytes. But from there, it's what do you need to look at your diet? What do you need to fill in uh, fill, for filling in the gaps? And then what do you what can you take to help get you closer to whatever your goal is? It's got me pumped because the electrolytes are my favorite supplement. So mm -hmm. there we Most go. Most important one. I'm with you. Well, it really flattens you out when you don't have them. You know, you really yeah. feel like crap. You're like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. You're like this stupid diet. But as soon <laughs> as you bring that back in, you feel fine. You know, makes yeah, we, so we were last summer, me and, uh, Dr. Gustin. So I work at uh, perfect keto and, and me and Dr. Gustin, we were out playing basketball outside middle of summer, Austin, Texas. We were playing on like a tennis court where it was like 110 degrees on the court. We were playing for like two hours. And, you know, and uh, like I said, I'm already a sweater. I'm sweating thinking about that day right now. <laughs> and, uh, and we, I was just so depleted after that. And I remember going home and just like, I didn't have energy to pick myself up off the couch afterwards. <laughs> and, you know, I was, it's one of those things like, I, I know the answers, but right. sometimes you just don't do it. And I didn't, you know, replenish electrolytes. I think that night I, I went out with my wife for dinner and I think I had a steak and, and probably drank a fair amount of wine that night and, you know, woke up the next morning and I was like, man, I just, I feel like hell what's going on. And then I realized I was like, oh, you, you dummy, you didn't do any electrolytes. And I, I had like uh, I used the element electrolytes. I really like those. Um, and I, I did some of those in water and like 30 minutes later, I felt like it was a revival, you know, like, I was like, man, I'm not cramping up anymore. Like yeah. I got my brains working right. Like, I don't feel like, you know, I'm, I'm like, my muscles are just flat or anything like that. So yeah, it makes a really big difference. Mm. What's it like working for uh, Dr. Gustin? I know that you guys did a book together. You guys did keto answers. That's a phenomenal book. You got to oh, love a you. book that just gets right to the point and has a Q and a kind of throughout the entire book. I thought that was really awesome. So thank you for that contribution. Um, but it's my understanding that Dr. Gustin, um, he was a chiropractor and a very successful one. Mm -hmm. And as he learned about the ketogenic diet, he was like, screw all this. I need to help people in a different way. And he just kind of exploded into this mm -hmm. keto world. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, he is, uh, he's the reason why I work here too. He's, uh, he's been a phenomenal mentor to me and I have nothing but good things to say about him. You know, when I, when I came out of grad school, I was like, really, sp like I was, pretty afraid of like the industry and stuff because there were just so many people who were doing it for the wrong reasons or putting out like really bad products and stuff. And, and, you know, before I ever started even working here, I was taking some perfect keto products cause I liked them. And then when they approached me about working here, I was like, ah, you know, I, I don't know. It, I don't know if I want to go that route of working for a company. I don't really know what they're about. But then after getting to know Dr. Gustin and, and seeing like one where his heart was in all of this about, how he really just wanted to help people. But then looking at like his quality standards on things, I mean, for our bars that we put out, like the guy spent like a year and a half, and did like 10 different iterations to make sure that it didn't spike blood sugar at all. Like a five point blood sugar spike. And he was just like, nope, not good enough. Back to the drawing board. Like never seen anybody with the quality standards that this guy has. So um, it's really cool to see somebody in the space that 
is, you know, that has a company that they're building, but they're doing it for the right reasons of trying to help people, trying to, you know, when we, when we think about product development here and people come up with ideas for different products, his answer is usually like, nope, somebody already has a good product there. That problem's already solved. We're not going to do that. We're going to address the problems that people need. Um, you know, what are the things that actually are going to help people? So uh, it's been awesome working, working for him and, you know, his, his uh, mindset and the way that he attacks each day. I mean, he's, he's a pretty, pretty cool guy. And if anybody has the opportunity to ever, you know, meet him in person or uh, listen to him on a podcast or anything, I highly recommend it because he's always going to offer a different point of view than, than what you're used to. Awesome. Where can people find us? So they can find out more information about you. Yes. So I, uh, I'm on social media as the ketologist. Um, so you can find me on pretty much every social media channel, but uh, Instagram is the best one for me. I answer every single DM that comes into me eventually. Uh, it might take a couple of days, but every DM that comes in, I, I get an answer back to you. So I love helping people through that. Um, I'm also on uh, YouTube as Chris Irvin MS. And then I have a website that's the ketologist.com that has a lot of like blog posts and, and things like that up for people to read. So um, those are probably the best ones. And then, you know, for anybody who has, if you have a lot of questions about keto, uh, the book, like you mentioned, is a, is a great place to start. We have like almost 270 qu uh, questions that are answered in that book. So that would yeah. be another great place for, and, and you can check that out on Amazon. So you going to any of these uh, conventions or summits or anything like that coming up, or are you going to the Arnold Classic by any chance? That's where we'll, we'll, we'll be going. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I just, I haven't been to the Arnold in like two years. And just the other day I was like, you know what? I need to make it out there. So I, <laughs> I actually do plan on making it out there for her because I love, I love that stuff. Nice. Um, a lot of people don't know that about me that I actually think I'm, I'm pretty into like the bodybuilding community. Uh, I've, I've followed it for a long time. And uh, so I do plan on being out at that. I'm also going to be at uh, FitCon in uh, Salt Lake city. So I'll be up there. I'm actually going to be talking on Friday at that conference. Uh, so those are the two big ones. And then uh, in the, I'll be at paleo FX out here in Austin, which I think is in maybe April um, keto con, which will be out here too. And then there's a, there's another small event that's up in the uh, tri-state area of New York. That's called the keto symposium, which, uh, I highly recommend people checking out. I'm going to be speaking there, but I'm definitely the B lister on this list. Uh, it's got Thomas Seafried, Dr. D'Augustino, Mike Mutzel, um, the, the top, top guys are going to be speaking there. So that would be another good one for symposium. For that sounds intimidating. Symposium. Right, yeah. I got to go to the symposium. <laughs> kind of makes, symposium. Me, it makes me feel fancy and formal though. So yeah. I kind of like it. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on guys. I had a blast. Have a good rest of your day. Yep. You guys too. Wow. Mm -hmm, not bad. No, that, that was that was awesome. I like the um the you can and the ketones. Ketones taste like butt, but <laughs> like mm -hmm. like I'm 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 interested in that. Interested in, in, that. in eating butt. Well, I mean, we all know this, but um <laughs> <laughs> long pause. Long pause. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. Dude, that was but that was great. I think that had like the best keto information that I've ever heard. Seriously, yeah. There, there, there's so much there, whether you're an athlete or not. I love like, that a couple yeah. times he tried to like explain it and then he realized like that's not a good route to go and then he just talked normal. Yeah. You could see him kind of computing it in his head uh -huh. like like little robot stuff going off in his head. But then he was like, <laughs> I'm not going to unleash all that. There's no reason for that. <laughs> but there's a lot of like applicable stuff in this podcast. It's like stuff you can take away. Um, and it's like that, that the electrolyte aspect that he talked about, I know I talk about like how much I use those electrolytes but i think he's one of the guests or one of the only guests that i think harped on the importance of it if you're using a ketogenic diet because right. a lot of people don't supplement electrolytes or don't don't utilize enough of it and mm -hmm. they don't take in enough sodium and they're right. always wondering why they feel tired so this lack of pump that a lot of people feel when they're doing low carb and keto mm -hmm. might just be that electrolyte deficiency yeah. yeah i mean we know from from getting a pump in the gym that it's from not having nutrients right mm -hmm. and and one of the nutrients can sometimes be a carbohydrate well, you know, that's a macronutrient, but the micronutrients are going to be important too. So if you get the micros and you're not getting the macros, maybe you can kind of get halfway in between, you know, the old pump that you used to get. And maybe, you know, when you get yourself, you get your uh, metabolism kind of in check and get your body fat levels to something appreciable, you can, you know, start to bring some of those carbs back in too. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talked about the element one that you you mentioned to me before. Yeah, too. I'm they make about a they, yeah they make a kick ass one. I know we're, we're sponsored by some other people, but they have a fantastic product that has been kind of brought to market by Rob Wolf. I think there's another person involved, but mm-hmm. uh, the um, Keto Gains is involved in it too. He has an Instagram. That guy lost like uh, t- uh, t- Tyler Cartwright. He lost like I don't know 300 pounds or Oof. something wild like mm-hmm. that. Um, but man, those they taste really good. You know, that's that's one thing that's tough with yeah. those electrolyte powders. Mm-hmm. It's a powder, huh? Yeah. Yeah, they they sometimes they don't taste so good. Yeah, when you make something that tastes really good, I mean Perfect Keto has it on lockdown with some of their protein powders, the MCT oil powder, the uh the bars. I mean, it's like what's going to keep you like, you know, they have subscription on there too. You can just subscribe and and just keep getting them to sent to your house. Yeah, I'm gonna grab it. That, I mean, that's a way to like, to do it. Right. And then, uh, with these guys with element too, they have kind of a similar thing. I think it's on Amazon. I think it does have a uh, thing that you can just subscribe for. But when I got it, I actually had no idea like Rob Wolf was involved in it. And I saw his name on there too. And I was like, damn, I was like, that's kind of up. I kind of up their stock a little bit. I love Rob Wolf. He's got a lot of great information. So yeah. We're going to have to get Rob Wolf on the show. We got to get Dominic on the show. It's been a long time coming. Mm-hmm. I've been friends with him for a long time and I've met him in person and hung out with him and stuff, but just never had him on the show yet. So we'll get to the bottom of all this. That's going to be mm-hmm. awesome. I'd, 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 I'd love to be. He'll make it. Them. He'll make every single person that listens to the show go keto. <laughs> he really will. <laughs> oh, he really no. will. I mean, he just like has so much information where you're like, it just doesn't make any sense for me to do anything else. You know, the, the, I think, um, the really cool thing about Dominic, though, is his demeanor when he talks about a lot of things. Uh, I remember years ago, I don't know if it was years ago, but he was debating Lane, I think, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, they were on Rogan together. Yeah, they, yeah, they were on Rogan together. and um, He's so kind, too. He does not about to fight anybody. Being, yeah, being honest, man, Dominic, like, <laughs> even if he, like, he was spitting facts, but just because of his demeanor and the way he was delivering, like, you, he's a cool dude. He's just yeah. Like, yeah. You like the guy. I yeah. like the guy. He had a lot of great information. Yeah, yeah, and he's somebody that you can look at and be like, wait, how much do you deadlift? He's, and it's like, uh, how jacked are, like, all right, I'm going to listen to whatever the hell he this guy's saying. for 11 days and then pulled 600 pounds for like 10 reps. That <laughs> man is a beast. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a, like a, like a myth or something, like a story <laughs> you would tell. Be like, hey, here's what he did this one time, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, well I saw him do this, you know? And he, and he wears button up shirts with no undershirt, but he lets the chest come out mm. and oh, it's smooth. Man. It is smooth. <laughs> the legend and tales of Dominic D'Agostino. Oh yeah, you don't want to get too, too many tales. <laughs> <laughs> or do you? Or too many legends? I don't know. Were you with me on that trip when I went and visited him? Visited yeah, him? yeah, we were. And there was like some sort of weird, like the active shooter thing going on or <laughs> something strange, right? So- yeah, we were, Something he, he really was weird showing happened. us all kinds of scientific, smart stuff, and we're just like in awe, and then all of a sudden, you know, like his phone starts ringing, and he picks up, and he's like, ooh, there's an active shooter in this department. He's like, that is next door. We shouldn't go anywhere. He's like, what do you mean? And so we're like, well, fuck, what do we do now, you know? And then eventually, I guess they, I don't know, they... Probably everything was cool yeah. or whatever but yeah, we were like what that's that's scary the other thing i remember the most about <laughs> like you'll protect us though right Dom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah if shit goes down <laughs> the the crazier thing well not crazier but the other crazy thing i remember is the uber driver that we got that day it was like a minivan mm-hmm. and the the like floor was like fake grass what <laughs> oh yeah, yeah and that guy drove like a fucking maniac wow <laughs> he darted into like eight lane traffic and just went i was like oh my gosh we're gonna die mm, what a trip it, it was, was a trip, a trip. It was, it was a crazy trip. yeah that's cool that he's gonna be at the arnold i wonder if uh i wonder if anthony gustin will be there as well probably they're probably cool traveling packs he mentioned some other names something volnick yeah jeff volnick he's, jeff volnick? he's in ohio so I should try to see if we can uh, contact him. I have, I think I have his information through, you know, we have somebody here too in Davis that, that I need to, uh, need to grab. I mean, he was just at UC Davis for a long time. His name is Dr. Finney and he's been a, a long time keto proponent. And I mean, he's got just the facts that these people have, the information that they have. It's just, it's just crazy. You know, it's, it's cool that they can kind of, um, it's cool they can kind of bring out some of this background where you can hear all this information. Then you can kind of hear like, where did all this information go and why? Like yeah. why? Like why? Like why isn't it like readily available anymore? And it, it's not really like I don't think anybody tried to 
bury it because they want everybody to be sick or anything weird like that. It's just that um, a lot of the agenda of the country and a lot of the agenda of, um, you know, selling corn and selling wheat and all that stuff, it just, it came to the forefront. So there wasn't really a lot of great reasons to talk about it because I don't, I don't really think anybody knew the impact that that stuff was going to have on our population. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, uh, you know, it just, it, it's kind of absurd when you look back at it and start to think about it. It's like a, a terrorist group couldn't have done a better job, you know, destroying our yeah, country uh, with the way that we've done with our own, our own food system. It's really wild. It's like, Hey, let's figure out a way to like slowly intoxify everybody. So they can't really defend themselves. So they get really big and unhealthy and can't think straight and everything. And it's just like, Oh man, we'll get it. We'll get them so unhealthy that they can't reproduce. Like that'll be perfect. You know, that's what we'll do. It's like, Holy crap, man. They've, they've, that has been happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's, that's quite scary. the conspiracy theory. I mean, I can still reproduce. Don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not with either one of you guys, I don't think. You no won't. offense. No you offense. won't. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Good thing gosh. Andy doesn't listen. I love I love yeah, babies, so I always tell Andy, I'm like, oh, look at that little. She's like, no. She's like, get out of here. <laughs> Go away. Do you want another baby? I don't know, man. I love kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really do. That's maybe not a reason to have another child, though. Like, <laughs> borrow somebody else's for five there minutes and hand them back when they poop their pants. Oh, man. God. Like, here you go. Babies. All right. We should get out of here, huh? <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take us out, Andrew. What do we got going on? Uh, well, I'll just let you guys know. You can find me on Instagram at I am Andrew Z. Please make sure you're following the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project Podcast. Shh. Oh, oh shit. Smokey. Smokey just walked in. I'm going to blow it now. Oh, and a guess. Um, awesome. At MB Power Project on TikTok, Twitter, and Byte. Um, thank you, everybody, that's been hitting us up with the reviews on iTunes. That's that's a huge help. Yeah. Um, shout out to whoever I read at the end of this podcast on the audio side. You guys will hear it. Um, and that's all I got. And Sima, where are you at? And Sima Yin Yang on Instagram and YouTube. At Sima Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Yeah, Mark? I think I'm on day 44 of carnivore 100 mm. i keep losing track i yeah. need to like make a calendar for it or something I, I have to look into my youtube and then i have to like look at the back end of it to see like what day it is yeah. <laughs> well you start on the me. first right oh actually no, no, well, yeah no, i started on january one so it's that starting makes to get, sense 44. starting to get complicated but All anyway kind of stuff and then uh real quick shout out to markbell.com yeah. uh you don't know this but we trained this morning oh my god yeah there I, you go i did a bench workout with mark bell as it, he was somewhere else in the world felt like nothing <laughs> there you go felt it felt easy i actually did run this morning but i had a hard time running because the last time i ran both hammies got really really super crazy tight hmm. i don't know why i need to probably work on some of that stretching you least like, hypervolt in your hamstring oh so i did and that actually helped a lot i yeah. i used the uh ball one and i just sat on it last night while i was eating dinner the dog was freaking out because I was like, what's this vibrator you're sitting on? <laughs> the dog was like a little uh, unsure about what I was doing. Anyway, it helped a lot because I don't think I would have been able to run today mm. if I didn't do that. So that helped a ton. There you go. Anyway, let's get the hell out of here. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell on all forms of social media. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never a strength. Catch y'all later.